Have you ever noticed how great composers like Bach or Mozart will often introduce a main theme at the beginning of a piece that reappears throughout the composition but is changed to evoke a different mood? In Scripture, the theme of the Good Shepherd introduced in the 23rd Psalm reappears in the writings of the prophets, but each writer shapes the theme to emphasize something different. Jeremiah talks about the Good Shepherd before Jerusalem falls. Ezekiel from exile in Babylon reflects on both bad sheep and bad shepherds. Zechariah anticipates the turning of the sheep into shock troops. This session will briefly trace the Good Shepherd tradition in its journey through the prophets. We are ready now to move out from the 23rd Psalm, which we've uh, looked at and tr found in it wonderful things, which the Lord through the great servant David has put for the life of the church uh, and uh, through the life of the synagogue all across the centuries. <clears throat> and now we want to branch out and see what happens to this collection of images. Remember, we talked about what these 10 major points are, the, the sheep, the, the good shepherd, the identity of the good shepherd is God, the fact of the something is lost, the shepherd has got to go after it, uh, a price is paid to bring it back, there is a celebration, the celebration takes place someplace, either in the house or someplace else, and that collection of ideas are there in the consciousness of Israel. And 400 years later, Jeremiah decides to take that collection of ideas and reuse them. And he does so in a very creative and a very powerful way. Now, Jeremiah was living in very, very difficult times. Uh, the Middle East through which I lived, I was uh, was by God's grace managed to survive seven Middle Eastern wars and uh, I didn't count them as a war unless you could smell the cordite unless there was cannon fire and uh, heavy guns firing around us so I know something about what uncertainty means and uh, trage the tragedies of war. Jeremiah saw a lot more. Uh, he started off with the Assyrians in control of things and then Nineveh falls in, 12, in 612. And then it next is the Egyptians, and they've got almost five years of total Egyptian domination. And then in the 605, the Egyptians are, are overrun by the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians run things, and the king of Israel decides he's going to revolt against them. Of course, he loses. And then in 598, you have the first deportation to Babylon, in which the Babylonians take the top people in all fields, government, everything else, the arts, whatever they wanted, and off they go. Uh, Jeremiah sticks around with the people that are still there. And 10 years later, uh, the king tries again to revolt. The Babylonians come. There's a final shootout, if you please, and everything is lost and the city is destroyed. And Jeremiah lives through all of this, almost lives through three different superpowers running the country from some distance away. You start off with the Syrians, then you've got the Egyptians, and then you've got the Babylonians. And Jeremiah knows that it's going to end up that way because they have worshipped idols and they really don't care. And thereby, because of their worship of idols and having abandoned their covenant with, with, uh, with the God of Israel, the God of Israel is no longer responsible 
to keep them safe. And when that shalom of God is lifted, they are now prey to any powerful country that comes along. And he says so, and he's not popular. And so particularly when he, the Babylonians come and attack after, after the second round with the Babylonians, the one that ends up with the destruction of the city, Jeremiah is seen to be disloyal. And he's thrown down into a pit and he's rescued. Finally, they end up with house arrest. And he uh, has to try and prophesy to the people in the light of this great uh, tragedy that he is facing and so that he and the nation are facing. So in chapter 23, verses 1 through 8, Jeremiah takes the language and the structure of the 23rd Psalm and with some critical revisions, retells it to apply it to where they are and what he perceives to be the word of the Lord for the people at his time and in his day. And he has to add something, something that David didn't have, because for David, it was not a problem. He starts off by talking about bad shepherds. And uh, I hope you have the text of Jeremiah 23 before you, and I'll read a part of the beginning of it. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away. You have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds. So here are the bad shepherds. And then he starts talking about how God is going to respond to the crisis of the bad shepherds who've blown it and have caused the the flock to scatter and be driven away. And there is an affirmation that God is going to enter history and is himself personally going to solve this problem. And Jeremiah writes, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back. Aha! There's that verb shub that we saw in the 23rd Psalm. Yeshubib nafshi. He brings me back. He causes me to repent. Who is going to do it? God himself is going to enter history, round up the lost sheep, and he is going to bring the flock back to their fold. Their fold, for Jeremiah, is the land of Israel. I will set shepherds over them and will care for them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall any more be missing. We're not going to lose any others. And then he says, and I will raise up uh, for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The king's name will be, the Lord is our righteousness. Fine. The bad news is that the flock is lost, the whole nation. And the bad news is that we've got bad shepherds that are responsible for this. The solution is that God is going to enter into history himself and is going to round up the lost flock and is going to bring them back, shub, and restore them to the land. The return is not to God. The return now is to the land. It is now a political theological text that Jeremiah creates to speak to the problems of the people in his day. And then the third thing that Jeremiah says, which is really quite amazing, and that is he draws a comparison between when the people were in exile down in Egypt and the exodus brought them back, and now they're going to be in exile in Babylon, and the Lord himself will enter history and will bring them back. After this happens, 
what's going to be the dominant sense of the image for return? Here's what he writes. Therefore, behold, the days are coming when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, the Exodus. But as the Lord lives who brought up and gathered the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of the countries where he had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. This rescue where God is uniquely himself involved in bringing them back is from Babylon is going to be more important than the return from Egypt. Right now, what do we, what do, what do we learn from what Jeremiah and his retelling of the 23rd Psalm uh, for the nation who is there uh, listening to him as the prophet of God? A great many things that we can only mention very briefly. First of all, Jeremiah makes clear that the failures on the part of the leadership of the community of faith are very serious and they are not to be overlooked. Second, he points out that an entire flock can be lost and destroyed. That is, lostness is not only a problem for an individual, it can be a problem for a community. A whole nation can be lost. Think of Germany in the 30s. It's also true that churches can be lost. As N.T. Wright has said, it's possible for majorities to be schismatic. We have here not only an individual problem, we have a community, the potential of a community problem. The third, we notice that the sheep belong to God, not to the shepherds. And God cares for the flock even when there are bad shepherds. Jeremiah affirms unshakable confidence in a hopeful future at the very time the world around him was descending into the abyss. I've lived in the abyss in the Lebanese war. How you can formulate, have such a powerful sense of hope that that which determines all that you do is controlled by that hope that for you seems impossible. This is what the great Jeremiah did for the people. And fifth, one day God himself will appear and will gather back the flock. The flock will then, he will provide shepherds for them and will raise up for the sake of David a king who will rule with justice and with righteousness. The return is no longer to God, but to the land. That was important for them, but does create problems. There is no celebration, there is no house, and there is no female component in the story. Salvation to come is projected to be so great it will overshadow the story of the Exodus. Fine. This is now the first time that we have this great story retold by Jeremiah. The second time it's retold is by Ezekiel. Ezekiel definitely knows Jeremiah. He prophesied only a few years later. He may have gone with the first deportation to Babylon, so he may have known Jeremiah in person. He certainly has read what Jeremiah said about the Good Shepherd and the lost flock and God's involvement in rescuing the flock. David took six verses. Jeremiah took eight. And Ezekiel has 31. He's taken David's outline, and in each section of the outline, he expands it. We're not going to uh, read all of it. It's too long. It would take us too much time. But we'll just try to notice a few snippets out of it. But first of all, let's notice how Ezekiel puts this together. It's a very careful outline, and the outline is very helpful if it's in the back of our mind when we look at the material. He starts off talking about the bad shepherds and he really clobbers them. And then he looks and he talks about God, the good shepherd, who himself is going to come and straighten things out. 
And then, amazingly, he starts talking about bad sheep. And then God's response to the bad sheep. Many of you may well have had dealings with or worked with or even experienced a great loss at some kind due to great injustice. People who suffer great injustice, understandably, look at those who cause that injustice, and that's appropriate. But sometimes their sense of loss and their perception of the greatness of what they have suffered leads them to see themselves as righteous because of what they have suffered. The bad guys are these people over here who beat up on me, and I, because I am the victim of that suffering, am thereby innocent and righteous. They aren't. They're sinners like everybody else. And Ezekiel understands this. He doesn't let the people just sit there and wring their hands and say, look, isn't this awful what the, what the Babylonians are, have done to us and are doing to us? He talks about good sheep and bad sheep and the fact that not only does God have to solve the problem of the bad shepherds and the lost flock, but God has to solve the problem of the bad sheep. And we'll look at those in just a second. Uh, so there is the bad shepherds and God response and the bad sheep and God's response. First, the bad shepherds. What does he say? Well, the bad shepherds feed themselves instead of feeding the word feeding, translated feeding, in Hebrew really means shepherding, tending. It ha involves feeding, but there's more than that. The weak you have not strengthened, he writes. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not brought up. The strayed you have not brought back. Aha, there's our word again, shub. When the sheep strays, the shepherd is supposed to go into high gear and do whatever is necessary to go and find that sheep and carry it back. You haven't done it. Let them go. Who cares? My sheep, are, the result is that my sheep are scattered and, and no one is out there that is willing to go after them. You, the shepherds, now this is going to be his response. Hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, and you, the shepherds, have shepherded, tended, fed yourselves rather than the sheep. I am against the shepherds, he says, and I will require the sheep at their hands, and they shall no longer be shepherds. I have just stripped your profession from you. I've had it. You're out of here. You're not going to herd sheep again. That's pretty tough to say that for a people for whom their profession is the profession of herding sheep. And what is God going to do? Verse 11. Behold, thus says the Lord, I, I myself will search out my sheep, and I will bring them back, and I will rescue them. It's not enough to have a prophet to lead them. It's not enough to send a word that the prophet might have to give them direction. Here is now a very powerful affirmation that because of how deep the crisis they have fallen into as a result of their bad leadership, that the only solution is that God himself comes and rounds up the lost sheep. And he says so. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost and I will bring them back. And the verb shub again occurs. A key word through all of these shepherd hymns is this great verb shub. I will bind up the injured, strengthen the weak, the fat and the strong I will destroy, and I will feed them in justice. As for you, my flock, aha, now we're going to get a few harsh words about the flock. And he says, yeah, I'm going to judge between sheep and sheep, rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on good pasture? You must tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture, leave nobody anything except a bunch of mud. 
and you drink of nice clear water and you muddy up the water with your feet for the rest of the sheep that are behind you? Must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? My sheep, notice, are the ones who are getting beaten up on. He doesn't claim this tough crowd that's causing all of the problem. Therefore, says the Lord God, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean feet because you push with side and shoulder and you thrust at the weak with your horns until you have scattered them. I will rescue my flock who are getting beaten up on by other sheep. And I will set up for them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and I will make for them a covenant of peace. This is what Ezekiel dreams of in the midst of a people living in exile, that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places around about my hill, the temple, a place of blessing. And I will send down showers in their seed and seasons. And they will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke. And they shall dwell securely and no one shall make them afraid. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God and I am with them. And they, the house of Israel, are my people says the Lord God, you are my sheep. You are uh, the shepherd, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your, past, your shepherd, declares the Lord. So what do we have? The lost flock, the good shepherd who comes himself, God, and goes after them. The incarnation is promised as, a, as an incarnation of God himself who comes. The price paid is to search for and save and bring back. The repentance is returned to the land because it's now return rather than repentance. And the repentance of the soul is somehow set aside, perhaps implied, but not specifically mentioned. The story ends in the land. And a couple of chapters later, Ezekiel, who it seems has reflected on what Jeremiah said. Remember, we noticed that Jeremiah said, it's not the return from Egypt that's going to matter for you. It's the return from Babylon. OK. Ezekiel thinks about that, and he says to himself, yeah, well, I know how we returned when we came from Egypt. We killed everybody and drove them out. Is that the way it's going to be when we come back from Babylon? And he has a fresh word from the Lord. And he writes as follows. When you return, he says, you shall divide this land among you according to the tribes of Israel. You shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who reside among you and have begotten children among you. They shall be to you as native-born sons of Israel. With you they shall be allotted an inheritance amongst the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the alien resides, there you shall assign him his inheritance, says the Lord God. There's not going to be any more ethnic cleansing. That's what we did when we got back from Egypt. We've learned a bit about the nature of the love and the justice of God. And as we return from Babylon, it's going to be a new deal. We've been gone 50 years. Other people have moved in. They have rights. And their rights are the same as our rights. This is amazing language. Amazing to find it, and it's there in the text built on what Jeremiah said about the nature of their return as he reflects on the great hymn of the Good Shepherd. And finally, there is a third case in the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures in which there is reflection on the psalm 
of David. This is short. It's in Zechariah chapter 10, verses 2 through verses 12. In chapter 11, he starts talking about sheep and shepherd, and he wanders off in all kinds of stuff that no one can figure it out. And he talks about three shepherds, and he gets rid of them, and he's got two staffs, and one of those, then he breaks them, and they pay him, and they don't pay him. And all right, it's, it's, it's a good text, and it's worth reflecting on, but he is not taking this collection of images out of 23rd Psalm. So we're not going to spend time in this series looking at chapter 11. But in chapter 10, he does. And he has three little things to say. And the first is, he starts off, like Jeremiah, talking about the bad shepherds. And he says, the people wander like sheep. Oh, oh yes, he starts off by saying, the teraphim utter nonsense, the diviners see lies, the dreamers tell false dreams and give false consolation. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for want of a shepherd. My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. And then he turns to see what he, God, is going to do. And he says, the Lord of hosts cares for his flock. And he will turn them into a proud steed of battle. The sheep are going to become the big powerful war horse that God himself rides on when the people go into battle. Out of them will come the cornerstone, that's when you build a house, or the tent peg, that's when you put up a tent out in the wilderness when you have to sleep overnight out there with your sheep. And out of them will be the battle bow and the ruler and the mighty men in battle tramping the foe in the mud of the streets. And the Lord will fight with them, for the Lord is with them. The sheep become special forces. Ah, this is an amazing transformation. Maybe that's the word they needed to hear, but it's a long ways away from what we have had from the other witnesses. But then, finally, the prophet comes out in his conclusion regarding the, sh the sheep and the lost sheep and the bad shepherds and what needs to happen, the Lord of hosts and his care over his flock. And the text reads, I will strengthen the house of Judah I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back. Shub again occurs. And they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. Some things are the same with David, and many things are radically changed, never to be repeated. This little bit about the transforming into the war horse and the battle bow and the arrogant mili uh, military and the powerful rulers, uh, that's not there either before or after. But the other themes, the bad shepherd, the lost flock, the good shepherd is God, the incarnation is promised, the good shepherd will strengthen and save and have compassion and bring back, the return is to the land, no good or bad sheep, no celebration, and the story ends in the house. Very close to what the prophet Jeremiah also had to say. This concludes our reflection on what happens to this great hymn in the Old Testament. We saw David, then Jeremiah, then Ezekiel, and finally Zechariah. We're now ready to turn in our studies to look and see what happens to this great theme in the New Testament. It's not really possible to understand any of those four occasions in which we find it without knowing the Old Testament occasions and reflections of the prophets which we have just reviewed. Jesus now is the figure to whom we will return as we try and see what he has to say as he, if you please, presumes to stand up 
with the big boys and offer his own fresh interpretation of this thousand year old psalm with amazingly himself as the center of the story. <laughs>